Hello from Heirloom Books at 6239 North Clark Street in Chicago, Illinois. I'm Jeff Helgeson. Today I'm talking about a first generation of post-colonial, with a hyphen rather than without one, American writers, specifically Washington Irving and James Fenimore Cooper. Unlike contemporary unhyphenated post-colonial writers, who typically are characterized by dealing with issues related to the continuing impact of imperialism over time and throughout numerous and distinctly different areas of the world from the point of view of their indigenous populations, neither of these two individuals take on much in the way of such concerns. And they both, generally, sustained a perspective drawn from the pre-revolutionary European culture that had been transplanted within North America, essentially, in effect, remaining colonizers, even when representing, most notably in the case of Cooper, the noble cultural identity of at least one vanishing population of indigenous people, while also looking back a generation or so to the slowly diminishing frontier, generally during the period of what came to be called the French and Indian War, Western Hemisphere offshoot of the Seven Year War between England and France, a conflict that officially took place from 1756 to 1763, although hostilities had actually begun at least two years earlier, eventually serving to bring George Washington into a prominent military and social position. For starters, however, just to put things in a little better chronological perspective, as a hyphenated post colonial, Washington Irving was born in the city of New York on the 3rd of April, 1783, exactly at the time when the American Revolution ended. And he was named for the successful military leader within the effort to um, dissolve the political bonds which had connected the soon to be officially formed United States with Great Britain. About the age of six, in fact, after the first president's inauguration in 1789, the year of the beginning of the French Revolution and James Fenimore Cooper's birth, the young Washington Irving is said to have briefly met his namesake, receiving a laying on of hands blessing from the newly minted commander-in-chief in a small Manhattan bookstore. Several years later, the writer, in fact, commissioned a painting of this scene in watercolor, which I can say that I have seen during a tour where it continues to hang in his home called Sunnyside on the east bank of the Hudson River near the relatively small community of Terratown, New York, and not far from Sleepy Hollow. As a teenager, for his safety, young Washington Irving had been uh, sent up the river to this rural region of the state during a yellow fever outbreak in New York City. And it was within the Hudson Valley that, in addition to the tome he would eventually build after having become America's first highly successful writer, the author's two most famous stories would be set, Rip Van Winkle and The Legend of Sleepy Hollow. At the age of 19, Using the name Jonathan Old Style, Irving had begun writing essays for a New York publication called The Morning Chronicle, co-published by a grandson of the Puritan Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God preacher, Jonathan Edwards, named Aaron Burr, who, due to a close set of electoral results, would become Thomas Jefferson's vice president having received the second highest number of popular votes in 1800 and then been appointed to the position by the House of Representatives. Burr was also the fool, as Lynn manuel Miranda would have it, in his smash hit hip-hop Broadway musical 
who, during a duel in 1804, shot Alexander Hamilton. Coincidentally, one can only assume, that same year, Washington Irving left the United States and traveled to Europe, but then returned two years later to begin a satirical publication of his own called Salma Gundy or the Whimwams and Opinions of Lancelot Langstaff Esquire and others. It was in an edition of this periodical that Irving gave New York City its nickname of Gotham, according to an online article, that being an Anglo-Saxon word meaning goat's town. Irving was also to provide the name of the NBA basketball team from New York City, the Knickerbockers. This was achieved through an elaborate publicity scheme which, truly speaking, makes the false autobiographical efforts of Jonathan Swift, Daniel Defoe, and even the likes of Lawrence Stern pretty much pale by comparison. Apparently, in an effort to generate public interest and awareness of his intended publication, Washington Irving began placing missing persons announcements in newspapers regarding a fictitious local Dutch historian who had supposedly left behind a manuscript um, in addition to an unpaid hotel bill. Eventually, allegedly as a way to recoup some of his financial losses, the man's innkeeper released the text under the somewhat notable title of A History of New York from the Beginning of the World to the End of the Dutch Dynasty by Diedrich Knickerbocker. Within the work, Irving describes history as a register of the crimes and miseries that man has inflicted on his fellow man and a huge libel on human nature to which we industriously add page after page volume after volume as if we were building up a monument to the honor rather than the infamy of our species. I'm further observing that historians may be said to thrive on the miseries of mankind like birds of prey. The publication earned Irving $3,000, which at an average rate of inflation of 2.10% would be an equivalent of $160,000 today. And then, two years later, having moved to England due to what ultimately became a failed family business venture, Irving began publishing a series of essays and short stories that were ultimately gathered together under the title of The Sketchbook of Joffrey Crayon Gent. Most notably, these included the story of a henpecked husband named Rip Van Winkle who comes across, plays a game of nine pins and drinks with a group of apparently transplanted Dutch elves before falling asleep for 20 years and then waking up after the American Revolution to return home and live peacefully with his grown children, their somewhat quarrelsome mother having long since passed away. Also in the collection was The Legend of Sleepy Hollow, a story in which an amorous and economically ambitious school teacher, Ichabod Crane, after seeking the favor of the lovely Katrina Van Tassel, largely due to her father's considerable material prosperity, is driven out of town by the presumed apparition of a headless horseman, a tale that greatly contributed to many of American traditions of Halloween, as well as a popular U.S. postage stamp. A group of five other stories dealing with Old English 
Christmas traditions serve both to inspire Charles Dickens and contribute to the establishment of the style of the annual celebration of this December holiday within the United States. After traveling extensively in Europe and apparently attracting the romantic intentions of the somewhat recently widowed author of Frankenstein, Mary Wollstonecraft Shelley, Irving returned to the United States only then to be sent back overseas as a diplomat after having published two more collections of stories, Brace Bridge Hall and Tales of a Traveler, including the story The Devil and Daniel Walker. While living in Spain, Irving wrote a collection of stories titled Tales of the Anambra, as well as a history of the life and voyages of Christopher Columbus, in which he, Irving, introduced the persistent notion that people in Europe had once believed the world to be flat, something that um, New York Times columnist Thomas Friedman, in a very different way, has now reintroduced as a popular economic cultural concept. As for Washington Irving, in addition to a five volume biography of George. As a post-colonial writer, he essentially embraced both the old and new worlds, and as America's first successful author, his advice was actively sought by the country's next generation of writers, which included Nathaniel Hawthorne, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, and Edgar Allan Poe. As a six-year younger contemporary of Washington Irving, James Cooper, who added his mother's maiden name Fenimore when he was about 37 years old, followed a different and yet somewhat similar path to post-colonial literary fame. The uh, son of a wealthy landowner who gave his name to the municipality in which the game of baseball, America's pastime, was supposed to have been invented by Civil War hero Abner Doubleday, and which since 1939 has housed the National Baseball Hall of Fame and Museum, James Fenimore Cooper somewhat famously is said to have once thrown aside a popular styled sentimental novel and proclaimed that he could do better himself. Pressed by his wife Susan to prove it, Cooper began and abandoned one work but then published an imitative Jane Austen style novel set in England called Precaution. His next literary undertaking was a book he titled The Spy, which was published in 1821 and was set during the American Revolution. It was not only successful, being adapted to a stage play and translated into several European languages, but um, as the Macmillan Publishing Company's first volume of its fifth edition of an anthology of American literature was to say, with its portraits of Washington, George that is, and other historical figures and events, it served as the beginning of the American historical novel. Two years later, in uh, 1823, this work was followed by a book called The Pioneers that was set on the American frontier and became an immediate bestseller. It was the first of five leather stocking tales that included the um, Last of the Mohicans, The Pathfinder, and Deerslayer. Then, in 1824, Cooper published a book named The Pilot, which became the first in a series of 11 novels that capitalized on their author's experience as a merchant, seaman, and midshipman in the United States Navy after having been expelled from Yale University in his teens as a result of 
uh, a number of various undergraduate pranks and brawls. With literary success attained in 1826, like Washington Irving before him, Cooper left the United States for Europe, living in Paris and London and making a tour of the continent. It wasn't until seven years later that he returned to his manor house in Cooperstown and continued writing until his death in 1851, 18 years before the passing of Washington Irving in his own manor house 124 miles away in Terrytown, New York. Most noted today, in large part due to uh, motion picture and television adaptations, including the 1992 Daniel Day-Lewis version of The Last of the Mohicans, in terms of his frontier adventures involving Native Americans, Cooper once is said to have um, confessed, I was never among the Indians. All that I know of them is from reading and from hearing my father speak of them. But with um, regard to various other transgressions, um, Mark Twain once observed that Cooper had scored 114 offenses against literary art out of a possible 115. Also, with respect to Cooper's female characters, the um, poet James Russell Lowell said, The women he draws from one model don't vary, all sappy as maples and flat as a prairie. And yet, without apparently having violated Mark Twain's single remaining literary principle, uh, whatever that may have been, James Fenimore Cooper successfully managed to have published as many as 55 books, which collectively, it would seem, serve to firmly establish the popular American fiction genre of the historical novel, and according to the um, Macmillan Company's anthology, effectively created an archetypal Western hero whose many literary descendants range from the cowboys of movies and popular fiction to the renegade heroes of Melville, Twain, and Faulkner. In terms of both Washington Irving and James Fenimore Cooper, each of whom wrote in the period directly following the American Revolution, contemporary unhyphenated tendencies of post-colonial literature, such as subverting or generally modifying the discourse of presumed European ethnic superiority, was not exactly their thing. Writing back to what have come to be termed Western canonical works, such as an interpretation of William Shakespeare's The Tempest, in which the character of Caliban is seen as an indigenous Caribbean islander and the magician Prospero, a European imperialist, wasn't really what these two writers were up to. Instead of anti-imperial societal themes, Irving and Cooper, each in their own way, accepted the view of the British and Dutch settlers within the New World and embraced European society and its literary conventions, even while bringing new settings and characters into the mix, sensually serving as anti-disestablishment pre-colonial Eurocentricists. I'm Jeff Helgeson, and Heirloom Books is located at 6239 North Clark Street in Chicago, Illinois.